This is DW News, live from Berlin. Houthi attacks on international shipping turn deadly. Yemen's Houthi rebels strike a commercial vessel in the Gulf of Aden, killing two people. They're the first fatality since the group started targeting ships late last year. Also coming up. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley ends her bid for the White House after losses to Donald Trump on Super Tuesday. But that doesn't mean she'll endorse the only Republican now left in the race. And spiraling gang violence, fueling fears of a civil war in Haiti. The UN Security Council is holding an emergency meeting to address the crisis. I'm Nicole Frilich to all our viewers on PBS in the United States and all of you joining us from around the world, welcome to the show. Western officials say two sailors have been killed in a missile attack on a commercial ship off Yemen. The Houthi rebels have claimed responsibility for the attack. These are the first deaths reported since the Iran-backed group began its strikes in the Red Sea. The Houthis have been carrying out these attacks, they say, in retaliation to Israel's campaign in Gaza. U.S. and British forces have responded by striking Houthi targets in Yemen, but have so far failed to deter the group. Washington says it would continue to hold the Houthis accountable for such attacks without specifying what that would mean. The United States will continue to hold the Houthis accountable for their attacks, which have not just uh, disrupted international commerce, not just disrupted the freedom of navigation in international waters, uh, and not just endangered seafarers, but now tragically killed uh, a number of them. Let's get more from, from Stefan Simonson in Washington. Stefan, the first deaths in the Red Sea. How do you expect the U.S.-led Western alliance in the Red Sea to respond? Yeah, though, first of all, uh, there is an American uh, uh, Navy asset and an Indian Navy asset on the scene helping and, and assisting with the rescue of those sailors who were not killed but abandoned, had to abandon ship. Uh, some of them are, are badly uh, uh, wounded and... Uh, American uh, Navy uh, elements as well as Indian uh, Navy elements are helping those sailors who made it off the ship. Now, however, um, you know, this is, of course, not new. This started all in November last year when the Houthis declared that from then on they would attack any uh, naval vessel affiliated, and that is open to definition what is affiliated, is to the U.S., to the U.K., and to Israel. All of that, of course, because of the Gaza um, or Hamas uh, Israel war. Now, just a few days ago, a uh, U.S. destroyer, the uh, USS Carney, uh, was attacked by Houthis by uh, bomb-dropping drones and a missile. Of course, uh, the destroyer was able to defend itself and, and shoot this, this drone and those missiles down. But uh, again, what is to expect now is retaliatory measures from the U.S., from the U.K., from the U.S.-led coalition uh, that is fighting um, Houthi action, Houthi action in the Gulf of Aden in this critical shipping route. Uh, what could those retaliatory actions look like? Uh, airstrikes. Uh, the last uh, few were a few weeks, weeks back, and what is targeted then is is radar sites, launch launching sites for drones, for missiles in Houthi-controlled Yemen territory, as well as communication. Communication, radar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, they have not been very successful, as we can clearly see. Um, they have made a dent, at least that's what the U.S. and what the British authorities tell us, but uh, there is apparently more work to do, since the Houthis are still able to cause a lot of damage and now even human uh, loss uh, with their with those attacks in the Gulf of Aden. Yeah, could you kindly remind our viewers why the U.S. is so keen on getting the shipping route under control? Well, follow the money. It is a critical shipping route for anything coming from Asia, connecting the Middle East and Asia shipping and products and manufacturers to Europe, as well as to the United States. So this is critical, and the U.S. has always, always made itself a protector of international shipping routes, and this has commercial reasons, of course. So follow the money. That is, uh, that is why the U.S. and European partners are really concerned and determined to get the Houthis to stop what they're doing right now. That was Stefan Simons in Washington. Many thanks. 
Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has suspended her presidential campaign after a poor showing in the Super Tuesday primaries. Donald Trump won 14 out of 15 of those contests. He's now the only Republican left in the race for the White House. Earlier today, Haley thanked her supporters but did not offer Trump her endorsement. I am filled with the gratitude for the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. And here are some reactions of voters and Haley supporters after her exit from the Republican presidential race. It's disappointing because it was really refreshing to have someone speak reality and point out that this is not normal, the discourse that we have from the previous president, President Trump. And so I really hope in the next couple of days she doesn't turn around and endorse him. It was uh, expected what the media was covering and how the landscape in this country is about election, about the coming November. So I think she tried her best. Uh, unfortunately, nobody saw it, how her potential are. And um, that was this for the story. I don't think anybody really wants to see this type of a rematch kind of a scenario playing out. I think people were exhausted the last time. And now that you're nine months away from an election, people are keeping people motivated at this point. It's going to be difficult. Well, Nikki Haley is out of the race but hasn't endorsed Donald Trump. Earlier, I asked our Washington bureau chief, Enos Paul, to explain the significance of this move. Correct. That's what she not did. She presented herself really presidential, I would say. Well-chosen words, delivered with charm and strength. She definitely is not ready uh, to stop fighting for, for her vision uh, of the Republican Party. She renewed her call for a return uh, to conservative principles and warned actually against an isolationist foreign policy uh, of Donald Trump. Uh, and it is, as you just said, it is important to notice that she did not endorse Donald Trump, actually quite the opposite, as she basically said that he has to win the support of her supporters by returning to conservative principles. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the people who voted for Nikki Haley, because she didn't manage to win many primaries, but she does have a solid supporter base that is made up mostly of more moderate conservatives, doesn't she? Now, which way do you think they're likely to lean now that she has withdrawn? Well, there are, of course, Haley supporters who would vote for everyone uh, uh, who is the candidate of the Republican Party. But there are also often female Republicans who are actually hesitant to support a candidate who is not only facing 91 criminal courts, uh, court counts, uh, uh, but who is also uh, known for his misogynistic approach to women. Many of them uh, I talked to on the uh, campaign trail the last weeks told me that they rather actually would stay home or even vote for President Biden to avoid another term of Donald Trump. That was Enos Poole reporting from Washington. Now, with another set of Trump primary victories, the likelihood of a second Donald Trump presidency looms large. That's made European leaders nervous and vigilant. The possibility of a return to an America first policy in Washington and even the lack of support for NATO has forced officials on the continent to prep for a future without their most powerful ally. When he was previously president of the United States, Donald Trump described the European Union as a foe and threatened to make Europeans pay for U.S. protection. Now his America first policy could once again reshape transatlantic relations. For many European politicians, the possibility of Donald Trump's return to the White House is a nightmare scenario, even though they don't like to speak about it in front of a camera. Surely you're not inviting me to interfere in the internal affairs of our 
uh, biggest ally. It's um, the people in, in America who, who have the right to choose their president. In private, however, one diplomat described the atmosphere to us as a mixture of desperation and resignation. And it seems pretty clear that behind closed doors, officials in European capitals are working on contingency plans should there be a second Donald Trump presidency. I'm sure that there are contingency plans. They're not going to wait until the last moment. The advantage that they have is Trump is not anymore, unlike what was the case in 2016, 2017, is not an unknown person anymore. During his first term in office, Trump imposed tariffs on trade with EU members. He pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement and in what was the biggest shock, he repeatedly questioned the US commitment to the NATO alliance. Now he is delivering the same messages on the campaign trail. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, no, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. So could a second Trump presidency mean the end of NATO? It's not just about whether the United States is in or out. I mean, almost certainly the United States would stay in. But there are, there are levels of being in. And uh, other allies on occasion have, have sought lower levels of involvement with NATO, withdrawing from the integrated military command, for example, or simply, um, simply focusing on areas uh, outside of the European security orbit, which would leave Europe uh, in a position of having to, to sort of somehow fill that gap. Could Europe fill that gap? Not in the short term. Experts say NATO without the US would be weak. Europe's nuclear deterrence without American nuclear weapons inconceivable, at least for now. And supporting Ukraine without money and arms from Washington would be much more difficult. So what can EU leaders do? No matter what will happen in the US, um, Europe has to be able to do more on our own and in uh, cooperation with our allies. This is a wake-up call for, for everybody in, in Europe to do more for, uh, for European own defense. Doing more for European security could help, but it will take time for countries to be able to do that. A European Union army first discussed decades ago is still a distant endeavor. And in the meantime? If one looks at the experience of the Trump administration that we had, uh, clearly he views the world not just through nation states, but through individual leaderships, individual leaders, I can say. Not so much alliances, not so much agreements, sometimes not even states, but, but individuals. And so those individual relationships uh, matter. Building relationships, stepping up on defense, Europeans are bracing for Trump 2.0. And they know that a new phase in the transatlantic relationship might be looming anyway, regardless of who will win the race to the White House. And a look now at some other stories making headlines around the world today. South Africa has asked the International Court of Justice to prevent famine in the Gaza Strip. It has also sought additional emergency measures against Israel, warning that Palestinians in Gaza are facing starvation. South Africa has urged the court to order that all parties cease hostilities and release all hostages and detainees. Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met in the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, which has been ravaged by the ongoing war. A drone strike hit the city during their visit, killing five people. Mitsotakis called it a vivid reminder that Ukraine is gripped by conflict. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and state premiers have agreed on what they say are far-reaching measures to limit illegal migration. The federal states say they're overburdened, supplying housing, food, employment and education for hundreds of thousands of migrants coming into the country. There are also fears that voter backlash on these issues could help far-right parties in regional elections later this year. Well, our political correspondent, Simon Young, explained to us earlier what kind of measures they actually agreed on. Yeah, well, it was in fact at a, at a meeting uh, last uh, November that uh, Chancellor Schultz and the uh, state premiers agreed a bunch of uh, measures uh, essentially 
to look like a package to get tougher on uh, my, on the whole migration topic uh, generally. That was things like patrolling uh, the borders more intensively uh, and uh, also speeding up asylum application procedures, for instance, so that uh, people whose applications fail uh, can be uh, removed more quickly and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so this meeting today was, again, partly uh, just about uh, focusing attention back on that and uh, checking what, uh, what, what, where more pressure is needed, what uh, more needs to be done, what's already working quite well. Uh, uh, but I think you're seeing that, uh, as you suggested, you know, politicians from the mainstream parties are very aware that migration generally as an issue can be electorally significant this year in uh, some big state elections, next year in the national elections. Uh, and that's why you've got uh, people like Olaf Scholz wanting to be seen talking about it and, uh, and getting on top of it. But Simon, Germany is a big country. It's a wealthy country. Why is migration such an issue? Well, uh, you've got uh, an issue. It's an issue for local authorities, uh, which are struggling to deal with the numbers of people. That's what they say. Uh, they've got a problem when it comes to housing, uh, schools, public services. We've got a lot of people who've come in recent years. Uh, in 2023, there were over 300,000 new asylum applications. Uh, and that's on top, of course, of more than a million people who've come from Ukraine because of the war there uh, and some significant significant uh, numbers of people arriving uh, over the last decade, uh, particularly those who came as a result of the war in Syria, for instance. Uh, and uh, on top of that, there's also the problem of irregular migration as well. So I think what you're seeing in Germany is a sense that uh, it's the time to look again at this issue, look again, see if the rules are right, uh, see if Germany is uh, in step with uh, some of the other European countries, which are also looking at different ways to deal with the migration migration question. And that's why this is top of the agenda again. Well, Simon Young, DW's political correspondent here in Berlin. Thank you so much. The UN Security Council is holding an emergency meeting today to address spiraling violence in Haiti. The country has seen an explosion of violence in recent days as powerful gang leaders launch attacks in an effort to oust Prime Minister Ariel Henry. Henry's critics say that he hasn't stuck to his promise to resign in February, instead forming an alliance with the opposition until new elections can be held. As gang violence continues to escalate in Haiti, one of their leaders issues a strong warning to the country's prime minister. If Ariel Henry doesn't resign, if the international community continues to support him, we'll be heading straight for a civil war that will lead to genocide. Several gangs have been wreaking havoc across the country for months. But violence escalated in recent days, spurred by Henri's recent trip to Kenya to appeal for international support to quell the violence, and a recent decision to further delay elections in Haiti. Gangs seized control of Haiti's main airport, blocking Henri's plane from returning home. They also coordinated several attacks, including on a police station and a prison. The police fled, leaving the population to fend for themselves. So we had to flee too, armed with sticks to defend ourselves. Now it's the gangs that control the country. They could seize power because the situation is not good at all. Thousands have been forced to flee their homes as the civil unrest continues to spread. Well, here in Germany, police are blaming arson after a suspected attack on Tesla's European plant near Berlin. A far-left militant group is claiming responsibility. The electricity supply was cut off and production shut down. This coincides with environmentalists' efforts to stop Tesla from expanding the factory. CEO Elon Musk tweeted, The activists, quote, are either the dumbest eco-terrorists on Earth or they're puppets of those 
who don't have good environmental goals. Stopping production of electric vehicles rather than fossil fuel vehicles is extreme dumb, he wrote. In English, that means it's really dumb. A spokesperson says the German government strongly condemns attacks on infrastructure. Police vans near the Tesla plant, just outside the German capital, Berlin. A fire broke out at a high-voltage electricity pylon, which led to a power failure. Authorities believe it was an act of sabotage. The state criminal police are investigating on suspicion of arson and are investigating all leads. A far-left militant group has claimed responsibility in a message posted online. The power outage forced Tesla to halt its production and evacuate workers. For us, this really is an attack on this industrial site here in Brandenburg. We have over 12,000 employees who can't work at the moment. This incident comes as the electric car maker is facing protests against its expansion plans at the plant. Environmental activists are occupying a nearby forest, putting up tents and building tree houses as part of the Stop Tesla movement. We've occupied this forest because Tesla, which is building electric cars here in its Gigafactory 4, also wants to buy and clear this area of forest. We've occupied the forest to stop this. The environmental activists have issued a statement distancing themselves from the suspected arson attack. Tesla says production won't resume before next week and it expects the losses to run to several hundred million euros. Our political correspondent Hans Brandt returned from the Idol factory earlier and gave me this update. Well, uh, there's very little going on at the factory at the moment. We just heard about the 12,000 employees. There's very little to be seen of those 12,000 employees. Hands full of people are leaving or, or entering the building, presumably doing um, a sort of uh, cleaning work or that sort of thing. I spoke to some people who said that they just come in to have a look uh, how things are going and when they might be able to return to their jobs, but they were not able to say that either. Uh, it's likely to take uh, several days for the factory to start again at the moment. There's still emergency generators running there. There's still an emergency lighting system having uh, been put up and also emergency systems for all those Tesla electric cars to be uh, recharged as they are standing uh, on the parking lot in front of the factory. I also spoke to those um, environmentalists that have occupied a forest just outside the factory um, and they confirmed uh, what we've just heard that uh, they um, oppose uh, such attacks on infrastructure, uh, violent attacks on Tesla, even though they uh, are not very happy with the fact that the factory is there and that it is planning to expand um, the Right, I mean, the extreme left-wing group that, uh, that committed this attack uh, or that uh, issued a, a statement saying that it had done so um, clearly has a, a different agenda, something anti-capitalist maybe, and, uh, and also accusing Tesla of, uh, of being exploitative, of destroying the environment and so on, a whole gamut uh, of accusations, none of which really makes much sense, frankly. Yeah. And how disruptive is this for Tesla's operation here in Germany and how damaging could it be for the brand? Well, uh, we calculate, or the, the factory manager calculates, that about a thousand vehicles have been produced every day. So we get up to about 7,000 a week and uh, the factory is likely to be shut down for about a week. So you multiply by, by that by the uh, price uh, for those vehicles that cannot be produced and cannot be sold now and you get to those several hundred million dollars or euros uh, that the uh, company will lose. As uh, In terms of Tesla's reputation, there is still some criticism amongst residents in the area who are also not entirely happy about the factory being there. At the same time, it has a lot of support because it employs a lot of people and it uh, brings in a lot of taxes, obviously, uh, for the region and for the German uh, state. Yeah. Do you think this is likely to put off other international companies looking into setting up shop here in Germany? 
Well, I think the German government is concerned about this, although a government spokesman tried to downplay such fears today. Uh, and government spokesmen have been saying that they want to increase protection for critical infrastructure. That means for the electricity supply for such a factory, for instance, and also for crucial industrial um, uh, organizations. Uh, but that's something that's still a bit off in the future. And I think there is some concern here in Germany um, that other international investors might think twice about actually spending spending a lot of money to invest here in this country. As DW's Hans Brandt, many thanks. In Spain, a country of famously late diners, a debate has erupted over the opening hours of restaurants. The Minister of Labor, Yolanda Diaz, stated that late working hours, especially after 10 p.m., when many Spaniards only start heading out for dinner, pose risks to the mental health of employees. Many in the hospitality industry now fear that stricter regulations could negatively impact their business. Spain boasts the best nightlife in the world, popular among tourists and locals alike. Late dining until the wee hours of the morning is no problem, as restaurants and bars typically stay open well past midnight. Many Spaniards consider this a part of their identity and lifestyle. The Minister of Labor wants to clamp down on this late night lifestyle. It is not reasonable for Spain to be a country where we convene meetings at 8 p.m. in the evening. It is not reasonable for a country that has its restaurants open at 1 a.m. In addition to the cultural aspects of the debate, economic interests play a significant role. Bar owners fear revenue losses if they are forced to close earlier, especially in tourist areas. Like here, in Andalusia, where nightlife is a crucial source of income. We've already lost so many customers, especially during the pandemic. If we have to close earlier, then we're doomed. 1.6 million people work in the hospitality sector, accounting for around 8% of the population. The proposed changes have received mixed reactions. I work in the hospitality industry and have a family. It would benefit me. Many times, late-night business saves us. If we close earlier, it will kill us. In search of solutions, compromises are now being proposed. According to the government, different closing times depending on the location and target audience are being considered. Other suggestions include multiple short breaks during the night and generally more flexible working hours. And that's all the news for now, but stay with us after a short break. I'll be back to take you through the biggest stories of the day, and I sure hope to see you there. Bye-bye.